Good morning, everybody. Mm -mm -mm. It's Friday. Okay, so we finished up. We finished up uh, Wednesday with let me just get this chat box so what happened talking about uh chromatin state right and so if you recap that's really talking about a uh, bunch of different modifications where are we going at here we go chromatin remodeling complexes histone methylation and acetylation, which have, generally speaking, opposing effects on uh, transcription. Methylation is quite considerably more complex. Acetylation is actually quite simple by contrast. Acetylation being generally pro-transcription. And then also uh, DNA methylation, right? And those things all feed back into each other, right? So DNA methylation uh, promotes further silencing via the deacetylation and methylation of histones. Uh, the methylation or absence of methylation also, and you know the modification of histones drives chromatin remodeling complexes as well so this is a very complex topic that we've really just kind of had a look at without even though it might not seem that way diving too deeply into the weeds because it's just a it's a rabbit hole for sure <coughs> okay so next on the kind of let's go back up to here Right, we talked about uh, chromatin modifications. Now we need to talk about uh, control of transcription, right? So the modification of chromatin simply makes genes available for transcription, right? Doesn't mean that they're gonna be transcribed. Now we get into what's needed for transcription, right? And remember transcription or gene expression in eukaryotes is typically off by default, right? So you need things to turn it on. And those things are typically transcriptional activator proteins. So in uh, eukaryotes, we've got these two promoters, right? So in prokaryotes, we don't really have this because they're a lot simpler in terms of how their transcription is controlled in, in some ways at least. But in eukaryotes, we have what's called a core promoter, which is around uh, four to 500 base pairs, give or take. And that's where the RNA poll and basal transcription apparatus assembles. And that's basically the minimum required for transcription, right? So with that core promoter, you can get some level of transcription just by random chance. It doesn't work very well. And you're not really gonna get any control. So that's kind of like the basic bare bones uh, requirement, right, for a gene to be expressed. Now the regulatory promoter, is uh, essentially poorly defined, right? It's very hard to uh, exactly figure out what constitutes a regulatory promoter in eukaryotes because these things can be huge. They can rely on bits of DNA, as you see here, which are nowhere near the gene being controlled, right? So they're poorly defined. 
can be huge and they contain uh, DNA sequences that are recognized by regulatory proteins. And that's where the complexity of the control of transcription comes from. It's all about what DNA sequences are present in the regulatory promoter and what proteins that recognize them are present in the nucleus. Right, so you really have to have two different things present, both the sequence that the proteins are going to recognize and the protein that's going to recognize them. Right, sounds kind of uh, almost self explanatory, but really that gets at an awful lot of what's going on in terms of, you know, <laughs> cell specific expression of genes you know, temporal or conditional expression of genes, things like that. And so here's a bunch of language, right? It's gonna be how we're, we're actually gonna go through each of these uh, in turn, right? Because they all do different things. And so again, uh, regulatory promoters are, are stretches of DNA that have binding sites. Right, so these are specific DNA sequences. They're recognized by DNA binding proteins and they're bound by activators and or repressors, right? So this isn't just about turning on gene expression. It can also be about turning it off as well. What do you want? Sorry, I have a dog sniff my foot. Right, and so these cis regulatory elements, right? called CREs and often called response elements actually as well uh, include a whole variety right so there's uh, there are enhancers right which uh, promote transcription right they're bound by activated proteins there are silences so these are regions that do the opposite and there are insulators as well. And so these are essentially able to wall off regulatory promoters, or wall off genes. So activating one gene and the chromosome doesn't inadvertently activate another one nearby, right? Which you can see why you'd want to do that. And these kind of enhancers, now you can kind of group them into a little bit of a bigger group, which are called response elements. And so you remember we talked about how uh, bacteria coordinate gene expression very elegantly by lumping all the things required for a particular pathway together or process or whatever into one operon. And then they just control the whole operon, right, in one go. Makes things a lot simpler in many ways. So eukaryotes also coordinate their gene expression, but they do it very differently. They do it by the use of these response elements. And so these are, again, uh, patches of DNA sequence that when present in front of a gene, allow all those different genes to be controlled by the presence of one type of protein. So a grand example is uh, proteins involved in heat shock response. So, you know, when your body temperature starts rising uh, and exceeds the ability of your uh, homeostatic mechanisms like sweating and, and the like to cope with it, then you have this coordinated response which basically produces proteins that stop other proteins from falling to pieces. It's called the heat shock response. And so there are a lot of different proteins involved in that response, and they're all controlled by the activity of one or two transcription factors which are activated by rising temperature. So that's another kind of way of looking at this, right? We've got thousands, tens of thousands of genes, and there are many of those genes that are involved in the same process or need to be not necessarily in the same process, but in the same response 
to something, hence the name response element. And so if you're, uh, I don't know, under some kind of metabolic stress, for example, there may be genes that need to be expressed that produce proteins involved in, I don't know, breaking down proteins and feeding them into the Krebs cycle or, uh, you know, catalyzing something else into something that can be used or breaking down fat or, I don't know, a whole bunch of different things, taking in nutrients from the extracellular environment, which may be involved in different processes, but they're all involved in the same response to that condition. Right, so it's, that's kind of, again, another layer of complexity. And these can also uh, determine the uh, strength of the response too, right? So you don't have necessarily just the presence or absence of these response elements, but also the number of them determines the level of expression too. And so SV40 is actually a, a virus. Um, can't remember what, simian something? Anyway, maybe simian virus 40, I don't know. But either way, hey, don't bite my toes. Um, sorry, it's a little distracting. Oh, I'm sorry. Got to show a little bit of a puppy shot. I don't know if you can see here. Just high five in my foot. So not only am I teaching genetics, I'm also stroking my dog's belly with my foot at the same time. How impressive is that? Yes, and having to lick my toes as well, which isn't easy. So uh, this is a, a viral promoter. It's actually quite commonly used in um, protein expression systems. So say you want to produce a protein like insulin in uh, some kind of cell culture like yeast cell culture or insect cell culture or something like that to make it, to use it, uh, quite often you would put it uh, downstream of uh, this kind of promoter, right? If you wanted gangbusters amount of protein, right? So these uh, GC boxes are associated with very high levels of expression, which if you're a virus, that's what you want, right? You know, you wanna produce a whole bunch more of you and uh, get out before that cell's recognized and killed by the immune system. Other, uh, so this is uh, thymidine kinase. Oh, that's probably just some kind of cell uh, signaling uh, gene. Uh, have a histone promoter here. So this is something that you're gonna need uh, predominantly during DNA replication, right? Because that's when you need to make like, essentially another whole lot of uh, histone proteins uh, for the new uh, daughter cell, right? So this is gonna be expressed in those particular conditions, and that's gonna be very different from that under which thymidine kinase is gonna be expressed. You know, something that's really, really cool, let's see if I can find it, hey, get out of it. <laughs> get to see my Amazon search history. So butterflies are cool. We've got a load, a load of uh, monarchs in our front garden because we planted like three small milkweed plants and now we have an entire yard of milkweed, which is great for monarchs. Um, we actually had some monarch caterpillars, which is really cool. I've never seen those before. Anyway, so uh, several butterflies have what are called wing spots, right? And they um, let me kind of bring that up a little bit bigger. Right, and those are used as a deterrent against predation, right? So you can see there's a very strong uh, selective pressure for things like this because they increase the survival and therefore reproductive output of that individual. So the cool thing is, right, and this has been studied a bunch in term by uh, evolutionary developmental biologists or Evo Devo people, is that the pigment in uh, these eye spots 
is actually produced by the same gene that makes pigment in butterfly eyes. And so this, these are literally eye spots. Not only do they have the shape of eyes, but they also uh, are made using the pigment expressed in butterfly eyes. Now that's not that the pigment was in eyes and then it's transported to the wings. What actually happened is that um, the butterfly eye pigment gene, where are we at? Oh, ah. There we go, go back there. The butterfly eye pigment gene gained one of these response elements that's res responsible huh, for expression in the wings, either by a transposon moving around and dragging a bit of DNA with it, or a viral ins virus inserting, or what? I don't know. And actually, we don't know, right? It's not that I don't know, it's just that we don't know how it happened. Um, and as a result, the eye pigment gene used to be expressed just in the eyes. And if you look at some uh, related butterflies, right, which have, which do not have eye spots, right, their eye pigment gene does not have that wing response element. And so really you gained a new function. And this is actually a really interesting part of Evo Devo, right? It's essentially the change in control of gene expression. You gain a new function by the acquisition of a different response element. So now eye pigment is not just produced in the eyes, but it's also produced in the wings as well. So that's just kind of a, a cool kind of context um, example of how these uh, response elements not only can change, you know, they, they control gene expression right here and now, but they're also modular and they can move around, right? And if you gain one, then you essentially gain the function associated with that uh, response element. You know, whether that's a location of expression in case of uh, eye pigment in wing spots or, you know, response to a, uh, a different signal and the like. So, uh, and actually, well, I better go dig my, I meant to do this before class, but I forgot. Um, you can also have more than one promoter, right? So you can have one gene, but several different promoters, which will give you different transcripts and proteins, depending on the context in which those promoters are active. So let me just uh, <laughs> get to see my auction winnings too. It's really funny, actually doing all this online because you get this like free tour of my uh, free tour of my laptop. Where are we at? There we go. That was this one from memory. Oh, it opened at the same place. So this was a paper that I wrote uh, Oh, a while back now. Jeez, that's a while. Actually, eight years. Um, actually, you remember uh, sitting on a nice park bench at Penn State, writing it, which is a very pleasant time. Um, but anyway, so this was all about a uh, protein which is produced that turns um, byproducts of NAD metabolism back into things that can be turned back into NAD. All right, so it's called NAD salvage. Right, and you know NAD plus is really important and a whole bunch of cellular respiration stuff. So it's really important that you have enough of it around. And so it has a really funky gene structure. And part of that uh, was already known before I worked on it. And part of it I found out too, which is kind of cool. Doop -doo. So this gene has five exons and it has three different promoters, right? So the core part of the protein is encoded by exons two, three, and four. And actually here's the mutation that I was working on, right? It's a short truncation. And there are three different promoters which give you three different transcripts. 
One of those transcripts results in a protein which can be exported. That's what the signal sequence stands for, right? So it's an extracellular protein. So you can go from being extracellular versus uh, intracellular simply by changing which promoter is uh, used to produce that transcript. Also, these uh, promoters have very overlapping but different cell specificity, right, as to where they are expressed. And that presumably is tied into the function of the protein, right? It's needed in different places for different reasons. And so uh, a big part of this project was making a whole bunch of what are called GFP reporters. And so GFP stands for green fluorescent protein, uh, which is a totally awesome tool. Actually, it was a uh, uh, subject of a Nobel Prize as how transformative it is. And I use it all the time because it's super, super useful. Basically allows you to visualize protein location uh, in a living organism, right? You don't have to kill it, which is handy. So anyway, I made a bunch of uh, fusion constructs with all of these three different promoters and these three different uh, transcripts. And then you just look at it, right? You're not gonna show you that because that's super boring. But if you look at the different, uh, which one's which actually, I can't remember. One A, B, oh, D is all of them, right? So if you look at all of them, uh, it's just, Blow this up a touch. You might not know what a worm looks like. This is kind of like looking at the back of my hand. Um, so this is the head of the worm, pharynx. It's basically like a turkey baster, sucks up bacteria and grinds them up. They're bacteria vores. And this uh, kind of, uh, funny enough, is its butt, right? It's just a worm that's kind of been curved around. And there's another smaller worm over here which is not transgenic by looks of it. So anyway, these are all neurons in the brain of the worm. And these are a couple of neurons in the butt of the worm. And they do have butts. This is actually just right there is its, oh, that's a little bit crass, uh, anus. I was gonna say butthole, but I shouldn't say that. Anyway, um, and so you can see the neuronal processes. These are dendrites, some axons down here. These are all uh, neurons, right? Now, when you look at that in, from the uh, individual promoters, oh. <laughs> my wife's just come down for a break, so dog's gonna get fed. Right, now we get a different pattern of expression. So we get expression in pharyngeal muscles and neurons, we get expression over here in, this is the intestine of the worms, right? So each of those promoters are individually expressed in different places for different reasons, presumably, right? And so that gives you, not only do you have the control of those individual promoters or control of a promoter, but now you have multiple different promoters for the same transcript or for the same gene generating different transcripts, right? And that gives you a whole bunch more uh, fine control, essentially, more diversity of control at where things can be expressed in response to what as well. So there's another example here, which uh, you can check out if you wish. It's about um, stuff in, uh, I think lizards or insects. Oh, got the cat. Cat's going off now as well. Um, so now we're going to go into those individual cis response elements or cis regulatory elements. Sorry. So enhancers are um, again they're bits of DNA that are recognised by proteins, right? So specific sequences, and they are in many ways what. Uh, dictates cell-specific expression and also levels of expression. So you can have like a graded response, you know, a small amount of enhancer, small amount of gene expression, 
large amount of enhancer, lots of gene expression. And actually these multiple boxes allow that. So if you can imagine, if you only have a small amount of protein present, only uh, one or two of those boxes will be occupied, right? So you'll get initiation of transcription at a lower level. If you have all of them occupied, then you're going to get transcription every single time it can happen. So um, that cell specificity spells there, cell specificity, sorry, is dictated by what pr other proteins are present. And so remember again, all of these genes, all of these promoters, everything is the same in every cell. However, liver cells are very, very different from lens cells, right? the cells that make up the lens in your eyes. Liver cells are all about detoxifying nastiness that happens to be traveling around your body. Lens cells are all about focusing light onto your retina so you can see where you're going, right? And so even though they have the same DNA in these cells, they don't have the same activator proteins, right? And so that dictates which gene is expressed in which cell. And so in the liver cell, you have uh, activators present, which uh, recognize the promoter of albumin gene. Albumin is a protein. Actually, you find it in egg white. Not sure what it does in the liver. Something, I guess. Right. But you don't have the activators present or not enough of them for the crystalline gene to be exp expressed. So I don't know what albumin does other than, you know, make something tasty to go on your toast. But I do know that the crystalline gene is actually uh, involved in clearing the contents of your lens cells. And so as you imagine, if you want to see through your lens, you don't want it full of stuff. And so once your lens is actually specified as a tissue in embryonic development, then crystalline is involved in basically clearing out the cellular contents of those cells. That's why when you get damaged to your, your lenses right, through UV damage or whatever, that damage. Um, all your cats are going off again. You got multiple cats. Yep. It's like living in a zoo, this is. Um, yeah. Got to focus. I need like cat cancelling headphones, like specifically tuned to the frequencies that cats produce. She might be very cute, but she's really distracting. Oh, cat's about to fall down the stairs. Um, all right, sorry, got to focus. Yeah, so obviously you only want that gene expressed in the lens cells, right? Um, Oh yeah, that's why it's hard to repair damage to your lenses, right? Because uh, there aren't many living cells in there. And so those activators are only present for uh, the crystalline gene in the lens cells. And you certainly don't want other genes such as, you know, a general protein uh, gene like albumin being expressed, right? So this is what drives that cell specificity, right? Each gene has its own combination of enhancers. Do you want to go see my cats? Any requests for that? Well, I can see the one on the top of the stairs. No requests for cats? Okay, let's go see some cats. Just because they're pissing me off so much. Oh, dear. I'm not going up into the bedroom, love. Well, here's one. That's Caramel Cat. She's the most normal, I guess. So, there you go. There she is. Will you shut up? Yes. 
Yeah, no, she actually fell off there once and landed down on the stairs. She was, uh, she was fine. Shush. Yes. Oh, what a hard life. Let's see, a little tour of my house. Where'd the other cat go? No, that's just dogs having their breakfast. Munch, munch, munch. All right. You're going to be quiet? Good. All right. Let's get back to genetics. <coughs> nice little uh, cat break. Yeah, they're cute, but they're a real pain in the ass as well. Dogs are so much easier. Sort of. Although the main reason why they're, they're down here is... Uh, so my wife's on the phones and uh, my youngest dog, Pepper, she likes biting on squeaky toys. So she's answering the phone and there's a squeak, 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 squeak in the background, which is obviously not what you want. Anyway, all right. Nice little, uh, little cat break. Dogs have had their breakfast. Hopefully peace will be restored. So I can go on and teach this. All right, what's next? Silences. So silences do the opposite, right? So they're involved in uh, repressing. Oh, God damn it. Sorry, shouldn't swear. Got to let the dog out. All right, come on, dogs. How'd you go? Oh, can you let them out, love? Okay, next we have. They got little bells by the door and they pour them whenever they want to get let out. Ah, this is a little bit of a chaotic uh, lecture today. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, there you go. My wife says because it's Thanksgiving. There you go. So expect even more chaos next week. Um, and so they do that in a bunch of different ways. One is that they can actually block the binding of transcriptional activator proteins, right? So quite often, if you have an enhancer site, you'll also have a silencer overlapping with it. So if one is occupied by a protein, the other cannot be, right? And so that's actually very common. And another way of uh, generating that cell specific expression. So sometimes not only do you have different combinations of activators, right? But you also have different combinations of silences as well. And so it's in a sense, it's like a, again, it's like an equation, right? This plus this equals this. This but not this equals uh, something else. And they can also actually be in the core promoter, right? Or at least close enough to the core promoter. Let me get back. Here you go. Close enough to the core promoter that if they're present on or the protein that recognizes the silencer is present, it will prevent the assembly of that basal transcription apparatus, right? So essentially it blocks transcription directly rather than by uh, interfering with activators. Now a cool uh, kind of side topic, uh, which is always fun to talk about, is uh, actually, hey love, is caramel over there? Can you bring her over here? We get live biology. How about that? Unfortunately, I don't have a polydactyl cat. I'd love one. I'd actually get another cat if it could be, if it had more than the usual number of toes. All right. She's not going to like this very much. Come on, education is happening right now. I think. All right, so here's Caramel Fluffy Pants Cream to put out her full name. You wanna say hello? Say hello. No. Anyway, that's where. Yeah, yeah, I know you're not gonna like it. Let's see if I can get her to open her paws up. So 
here's the number of regular number of uh, toe beans for a cat. One, two, three, four. And then there's the, the fifth toe kind of down here. Sorry, my mic is bugging <laughs> her ear. <laughs> anyway, you just stay there. So digit identity is controlled by, oh, she's gone. And oh. now we have dogs. And that's the same in dogs. Actually, Pepper has uh, webbed feet, which is really, really cool. So she's very good at digging. You see? That's actually due to something else, which is another cool. And she's just got a sweater put on, too. Uh, hey, go back to work. You're distracting me. Um, where's that hand? Yeah, so. Digit identity and separation, right? Actually, this is a little bit of a side side track, are determined by a bunch of different things during development, right? Sorry, I have to lean over here so I can see past my dog. Ugh. And one of those uh, genes that controls digit identity, right? Because essentially, pinky, thumb, various other fingers in between, right? is controlled by a gene called sonic hedgehog. And I know it's kind of dumb, but supposedly it was because the, the son of the person that discovered it was playing a lot of Sonic on their Sega at the time, which kind of dates it, I guess. But anyway, as so essentially your, your hand starts developing like so, right? So you get a limb bud, and as that limb bud kind of grows out and lays down uh, you know, the upper arm and then the elbow and then the lower arm. At the end, you have something that looks a bit like that, right? So you have this sort of, yeah, disc essentially, right? Now, fingers are determined by high levels of expression of Sonic Hedgehog, which you can see down here, right? Next one along, what's that, the ring finger? right, has uh, a little bit less uh, sonic hedgehog expression. And then very little sonic hedgehog expression. Actually, it's kind of a little bit more complicated than that. It also is actually, it's bat poo crazy. It's kind of how I talk about it. There's a whole bunch of craziness involved in digit identity and formation. And thumbs have no sonic hedgehog expression right so that's how you get fingers versus thumbs and each finger has a different identity because they're all different right it's not like you have you know uh four pinkies because you don't so that's dictated early on in limb development by the expression of this uh sonic hedgehog protein and actually the gaps between them this is another cool uh, side side track. This is just fun stuff to talk about. That's why it was like talking about it, right? That's actually so that you get your hand kind of as a solid disc, right? And the reason why you have fingers is because the tissue in between is told to die by another protein called I think it's BMP4, bone morphogenic protein. Right. I don't know exactly how it does that, but the, the tissue between your digits dies, right? And so it's a multi-step process, specification which digit's going to be, growing the digits, and then separating the digits uh, by cell death, essentially. And so that's why Pepper, and she's coming back now, hello Pepper, has webbed feet or webbed toes, is because that process in her, well, I wouldn't even call it a breed because she's a, she's a super mutt. She's not just a mutt. She has so many levels of muttness. She is like an uber mutt, right? Anyway, uh, whatever random and convoluted ancestral history she has included a breed where that doesn't work very well. So I think labs actually have 
typically webbed feet. It's really good for swimming as well. That's why they're great swimmers. Um, but it's because that that process doesn't work as well as it should do. Anyway, long story short, and it's a bit of a long story. Hopefully you're still there. Um, if you mess up Sonic Hedgehog expression, you don't change the identity of those digits. You get more digits, right? And so essentially, if you either uh, overactivate expression through what's called a gain of function mutation in an enhancer, and this is nearly a million base pairs away from the SHH gene. Or you knock out a silencer, again, a long way away. You get expression of, and this is, I think, a northern blot from memory, like looking at mRNA levels. You get expression of sonic hedgehog in the top of the limb bud, which you can see here. This is the limb bud, probably of a mouse, I'd guess. And then what that results in, essentially, let's see if I can get this done right, is a hand that either has a pinky, depending on the level of expression, two extra digits or three extra digits, like so. And that's called polydactyly. And this is the foot <laughs> of a cat that belongs to a student I had over the summer. When I was talking about this, she was like, oh, that's awesome. My cat's polydactyl. Uh, and actually, there's a whole breed called Hemingway cats after Ernest Hemingway. And for some reason, um, as you can see, Mr. Tuxedo is not super happy about this. Um, but he has one, two, three, four, five, six uh, front paw toes. So instead of having four like so, Essentially, uh, let's make sure I do it right. It's like that. He has uh, six toes instead, right? And so this is purely, it's not a change in the actual sonic hedgehog protein. It's not a change in the regulatory promoter next to the sonic hedgehog gene, right? It's a change in the, the regulatory promoter way ways away right a long distance away from that gene changes its location of expression and the change of location of expression has a huge effect on the physiology and morphology of that individual <coughs> and as you can see i really want a polydactyl cat that'd be so cool i'd actually hold up the two cats. Here's cat paw one, cat paw two. How cool would that be? Comparative biology. Um, I actually had a friend back in a previous place who had uh, two polydactyl cats, but for some reason he wouldn't let me take pictures of them. He thought I'd har harm them or something. Not really sure why. And also, they are the absolute bomb at catching stuff. Actually, <laughs> let's go back to Google. <laughs> and as you can see, this is something I've looked at before. Isn't that awesome? I could look at polydactyl kittens like all day, every day. Absolutely no issues whatsoever. Look at that one. I think that's just a normal cat, maybe. I'm not sure. But anyway, they are super amazingly awesome at catching stuff because it's like they got like baseball catcher mitts for paws anyway hope you enjoyed that uh small diversion so obviously as well right you can imagine that right these enhancers when a transcription activator bound, essentially that DNA can bend in different directions, right? And the aim is for it to bend in such a direction that that activator protein contacts the mediator 
and that activates gene expression transcription. So the risk is that DNA actually bends a different direction and activates uh, a different gene, right? The transcription of a different gene. And so that's actually in some ways how gene expression can be coordinated, right? You can actually have genes which are on different strands of the DNA. I've found a few of these in my own work, right? And they share a common promoter, common regulatory promoter. Right, so you can coordinate expression of two genes with one promoter. But sometimes you don't want that, right? If those genes are involved in very different processes or expressing uh, them in different contexts would be a, a bad thing. And so to stop that, you use something called an insulator. And as you would guess, that insulates uh, neighboring genes from the effects or the activation of another gene. And so that looks something like so. And so you've got two, uh, again, you've got opposing genes, but now you don't want those uh, genes to be coordinated. And so even though you have these enhanced regions, this uh, insulator, it recruits what's called, a, as you guess, an insulator binding protein. And typically what that does is it prevents the DNA from bending in a particular direction. And so it allows this DNA to bend that way. So an activator bound here can activate transcription of this gene, but it can't bend the other way, right? So the, any proteins bound here can't physically interact with the basal transcription apparatus on a neighboring genes promoter. And so essentially it walls off different bits of the chromosomes, like this bit, you lot can play together, don't bug these ones, right? And so coordinated gene expression is good until it's not, right? And so you want to be able to do that when you need to, but you don't want any uh, accidental or unintended activation of genes. Because that is, it's actually it's quite, quite astonishing how tightly regulated gene expression is, right? And you can see that in all kinds of uh, human disease, right? I mean, that polydactyl uh, um, case study is an example of that, right? You really only want sonic hedgehog expressed down here at the posterior of the limb bud. You do not want it expressed up here because then you get a very different uh, outcome. You know, you do want, uh, I don't know, let's say um, bone morphogenic protein, expressed well like there's a whole bunch of them say during production of uh bones during development you really don't want that being produced later on because that could then lead to bone cancer essentially right so it's extraordinarily tightly controlled by a whole host of different proteins and those proteins right are the result of transcription so those proteins are often under control of other proteins, right? So you get this amazing like cascade effect where, you know, sonic hedgehog expression controls digit identity. Sonic hedgehog expression is controlled by other proteins, right? Those proteins are controlled by other proteins, right? So now you can get kind of a sense of the amazing complexity. Uh, behind you know us as a functional organism anyway i think that's more than enough for today uh we've still got uh some to cover we'll we'll definitely finish this on monday and um wednesday we should oh, i don't have monday wednesday friday up yeah we should have time to talk about some uh transgenics stuff
So yeah, try and keep the big picture in mind as best as possible. And then slot all these different bits into that big picture. It's all about controlling when, where, how much, and in response to what you want gene expression. And that's done at a bunch of different levels, right? So far we've covered chromatin. So that's a broad scale. Is DNA available for transcription deal? Now we've looked at all the different bells and whistles involved in control of transcription. And then we're going to, on Monday, move on to those next things in the list. RNA processing, stability, translation, and so on. All right. Have a fabulous weekend, everybody. I'm going to leave you with uh, a resting puppy shot. And I shall see you next week. Hope you enjoy this lovely, sunny, but not hot weather. Hello. All right. See you next week, everybody.